Um, I also want to sort of um, start by saying uh, I'm here um, based on the work of not just myself by any means, but also colleagues um, who work with me at the Harvard Family Research Project and who for the last 10 years have really been looking at what we know about um, out of school time, after school um, youth development programs. Some of you may know we maintain a national database of evaluations of out of school time programs. Um, that we put out there for other people um, to use and learn from, and we try to use and learn from them ourselves. So we've really looked at the, the fairly substantial, I think, for a field, um, investment in evaluation in, in out-of-school time. I think I'm going to talk today about, I think, what we've learned from that investment in evaluation um, and think about um, some of the directions in which we need to be um, moving in the future, both with respect to research and evaluation and also our general thinking about how we position um, out-of-school time in what I think are some important emerging policy debates. I also need to be clear about my biases, and I have several. Um, one of them is I think research and evaluation matter and are important in um, ensuring that emerging fields like out-of-school time deliver quality services, the quality necessary to deliver outcomes. Um, so I have a big stake, and that'll be clear, in, in the investment and learning from the investment in research and evaluation. It's, it's an important component of building a field. Um, and I think the out-of-school time arena, as I've said, has done a remarkable job with those investments, and more importantly, I think, trying to learn from them. Second thing is, in my professional life, um, I've really been focused and, in fact, got into education because I wanted to do something that would um, help economically disadvantaged kids. So a lot of our work at the Harvard Family Research Project, and you'll hear in my talk today, is really focused on um, trying to figure out how we use a variety of strategies, including out-of-school time learning, to support the development of poor kids um, so they have the same shot as more economically disadvantaged kids in, in our society. So those are, those are my um, two of my biases. I think my third, and it'll be real clear in this conversation, is that I think out-of-school time programs are necessary but not sufficient um, to get particularly economically disadvantaged kids, um, where we want to go. Very important. A lot of people don't think they're necessary. I think good schools are necessary. A number of other things are necessary. I'm increasingly coming to see, based on the evidence I see, that good out-of-school time programming is in the necessary category. But at the same time, it is not sufficient. So that sort of lays out, um, in a nutshell, some of my perspective. Um, today what I want to do is a couple different things, um, really outline, I think, what we've learned from these evaluation investments um, and I think some of their implications for providing quality services that pay off and better outcomes for kids. But I also want to look at what I see as some of the really big trends um, in this country that are going to influence what happens to the out-of-school time arena and challenge you to think about those. Several of you have heard um, this a variation of this program at lunch, and I'm hoping, or my talk at lunch, and I'm hoping you'll chime in in the discussion uh, with any thoughts that you have about this. Uh, in terms of stepping back and um, looking at what we learned, I'm going to first give you the Cliff Notes version um, of, the, of the evaluation part of this talk, and then I'm going to go into it in more depth. But, I think the Cliff Notes version of what I think we've learned from the investments in evaluation is that after school can move the needle on kids' development and academic success. So when people say, can after school programs contribute to learning and academic development, the short answer is yes. And I think we can make a not bad, pretty strong evidence-based case about that. And I'll talk a bit about that. Um, and I think that positions us as a field well, because we've got some evidence we make a difference to a variety of key actors, schools, communities, families. When people ask, what have we learned about what it takes to get these outcomes, I think we've learned some important things about what it takes to get the quality programs necessary to move um, the needle on a variety of outcomes. Um, and I think we've learned that it takes sufficient participation so one of the lessons is about participation. It takes quality programs, and I'll be talking a little bit about what I think we've learned with respect to that. And I think it takes strong partnerships 
between out of school or youth development, after school, whatever you want to call it, programs, and a variety of other organizations and uh, learning supports for kids in communities. So seeing us in relation and in partnership with others um, I think is important and I think we're beginning, only beginning, but we're beginning to get evidence that shows the benefits for out of school time programs and for kids um, of partnerships, for example, between schools and out of school time programs. So the short answer is yes, we can and that positions us, we can make a difference, and we are beginning to get a better sense about how we do it, the participation, the quality, and the partnerships. So that's kind of the cliff notes um, uh, to this. Having said that, I think, and this is the stand 15,000 feet above the arena and look down and try to look ahead to what's gonna be um, the challenges and opportunities for us as a field in the next, I think starting now or starting yesterday and probably continuing on um, for the next 10 or more years, let's look at what some of those big trends are that are gonna affect how we're positioned. Um, and several of you have heard me mention um, work that I heard about last week, uh, which is a future scenario mapping exercise that uh, was presented at Grant Makers in Education at their annual meeting last week that basically laid out a bunch of demographic and other trends that they thought people needed to be thinking about with respect to their impact on learning. Who's gonna learn, where they're gonna learn, and how we're gonna facilitate that learning. And the kinds of things that they were arguing with their sort of trend analysis were that learning is increasingly gonna occur outside the classroom and be networked. Out of school time programs occur outside of the classroom and they're increasingly networked in terms of the technology and I think networked with each other. They're gonna be increasingly technology based, access to computers, access to wikis, all those kinds of things. Learning is being transformed by technology. Many of the leading edge youth development out of school time programs I know are doing some of the most innovative and imaginable stuff with technology. Um, we're going to be struggling with diversity, how we, how we learn um, and manage diversity and turn diversity into the kind of innovative um, ways of dealing with diversity. I think a lot of after school programs are facing that challenge. They often have diverse populations and are trying to bring in understanding of how you deal with diversity, not just nationally, but also globally. More and more of these programs, and I saw this as a serious trend last week in Grant Makers in Education, are adding a strand about global learning to out of school time and after school programs. So they are struggling. We are struggling with that, but I think out of school time programs are positioned to do that in probably um, a unique kind of a way by virtue of the kind of learning settings that they create. Um, learning is also going to be lifelong, and I think if we are successful in after school in the ways in which we deliver our services, it will contribute and build the appetite for broad, lifelong learning for kids. So these are the trends these people identified, and I think the youth um, development out of school time, after school arena is poised to really be an important part of the conversation about what this new model of learning is gonna look like um, in the next 10, 20 years that prepares us for success um, in a global economy. So that's one big set of things to look about. I'll give, or look at, I'll give Dale the, um, the website of this group that are doing this kind of mapping thing because they present it as an exercise. There's, they give it for free. There's lots of web-based tools related to it. And I think for the youth development arena, thinking about what you're gonna look like in 2020, given the changes are gonna take place in the broader world is a very important exercise to undertake. I think the second huge um, shift, and several of you have heard me talk about this, is I think um, we are now at a point where we are going to be reinventing schooling and reinventing the school day. James Coleman, sociologist, um, now deceased, who I respect tremendously, started a conversation about 10 years ago that said, our school calendar is based on a 19th century agrarian model so that we could be harvesting the wheat in Kansas um, you know, between mid-May and September. Um, that calendar no longer serves us um, in the 21st century. There's a lot of conversation in this country at the policy level um, about how we're gonna reinvent the school day. 
Um, I think that's a conversation that that the kind of um, uh, or it's a conversation that folks like you in this room absolutely have to be in. And let me sketch out, um, I think, some of the um, parts of that conversation. And I use as my example um, one model that comes from my state, Mass 2020, is the organization. Chris Gabrielli, who was um, our um, second uh, sort of... Uh, candidate for governor on the Democratic ticket, didn't make it, Deval Patrick made it. But what Chris then did is continue his interest in out-of-school time by creating um, a model of a lengthened school day that involves kids coming in early in the morning um, and staying through 4.30 in the afternoon with a 2.30 to 4.30 piece of that day being provided by after-school providers. Now, a couple of key things about that model, it only lasts till 4.30 in the afternoon, so we've got issues around what happens between then and, say, 6 o'clock um, is one thing to think about. He's also partnering with out-of-school time programs like Citizen Schools that have an evidence base that shows they can move the needle on kids' development and achievement in a variety of ways. Um, so that privileges models that have the evidence um, in support of outcomes as part of that model. So that raises questions about what about the community-based uh, programs that provide a lot of the services in Massachusetts that don't have that evidence. Um, so that, that's another kind of thing to think about. Um, Ted Kennedy and George Miller, the two people that are the architects of No Child Left Behind, are behind legislation that's been introduced into Congress to provide support for the expansion of that model. I personally think it's an important model. Um, we should be testing it and trying it, but it's not the only way to extend the school day. And that's where I think it's important all of you in this room to get into the conversation about what do you think that day should look like and what is the role of the kinds of services you provide in extended learning. Extended then being not just the school day, but weekends and summers, because that's where the discussion is going. And I think it's getting there incredibly quickly. So if you do nothing else, I hope you will be challenged um, by, by this whole extended learning conversation and thinking about where you guys um, fit within it. Um, I think a third thing that I'm seeing uh, is a recognition on the part of people that are trying to close the achievement gap in this country that we're going to have to start building models that support particularly poor kids from birth through high school. And some people are now arguing and developing models that provide continuing support through college. Um, in my uh, project, the Harvard Family Research Project, we refer to this as complementary learning. We chose the label because we thought these different learning settings should complement each other. Um, Ed Gordon at Teachers College refers to it as supplemental education. Richard Rothstein in his book on class and schools doesn't label it, but basically puts under the umbrella a lot of the things that Ed and I put under our umbrellas when we talk about what this extended learning continuum from birth through high school would look like. Um, I think we're recognizing um, the importance of this. I point to work by, um, that will be coming out soon that, that I hope you guys will take a look at by Paul Tuff, who's the editor of the New York Times Magazine. Um, and Paul has been spending the last four years really intensively looking at um, Jeffrey Canada's work at the Harlem Children's Zone. Are most of you in this room familiar with the, Harvard, the Harlem Children's Zone? This is really a birth through high school effort in a, in a concentrated area in Harlem that starts with baby college in, in the first year of life, um, continues with high quality early childhood education, pre-K, um, high quality charter um, elementary and middle school, and then helping kids select good high, st high schools to go on to after that. It's an extraordinarily well-resourced model run by an incredibly charismatic and visionary man, Jeff Canada. Um, it's not going to be replicated anytime soon because its budget is many, many million dollars, but it serves as a heuristic example of the direction, I think, in which we're increasingly going to see efforts go that are trying to close the achievement gap um, for poor kids. So this, to me, says start thinking about how you fit in not just to the extended learning conversation as a context, um, you know, but also how you fit into a complementary learning conversation. What's the role of out-of-school time in this system we're trying to build um, from birth 
uh, through high school. Um, so that's kind of my, my 15,000 foot perspective um, of sort of challenges to think about, and I'll circle back to, to them um, toward the end of this. Um, I want to start um, thinking about what we know about outcomes by saying that 2007 marks um, the 10th anniversary of um, our real investment uh, in out-of-school time through the 21st century learning centers. Um, we now, we've gone from, you know, a few million dollars um, in 1997 to over a billion dollars in that one piece of legislation alone. And from what I read um, and track in terms of the No Child Left Behind reauthorization, that'll stay stable and perhaps even grow. So we've, to some extent, institutionalized out-of-school time almost as an entitlement of sorts. The money lasts for a couple of years and then, you know, seals off with, with 21st century. But I think we're at a point now where we're almost almost at an entitlement status um, for, for uh, out-of-school time programs. Um, we also have put a huge investment relative, I think, to other fields in learning what works. Um, so we have a fair amount of high-quality information, and by high-quality I mean experimental and quasi-experimental data from which to draw with a lot of studies that provide confirmation of what I think are some key findings that I want to talk about. So as a field, we have a relatively strong, still could get stronger, but we have a relatively strong evidence base, I think, to make claims um, for the value of investments in out-of-school time. Um, we at my project spend a lot of time um, synthesizing the results. Um, they're available on our website. We have a new research brief that will be up in the next six weeks or so. I encourage you to, to take a look at it because um, uh, I think you know, it may be helpful to you as you try to make your case for investments here. Um, I think, as I said, that there are clear um, indicators from multiple studies that there are a set of interrelated benefits from out-of-school time programs for kids. They can contribute in a variety of ways to kids' life success. In the academic arena, they contribute um, to better attitudes towards school and higher educational asp aspirations, better attendance, um, more homework completion, less dropout. And there are some studies that show that they move the needle on school-related um, and academic success. Um, there's a lot of debate in the field about whether we should hold them to that standard or not. Um, what I take away from it is we have to, in some ways, show the way in which we contribute to kids' school success. And that may be through things like attendance, homework completion, programs that really intentionally try to move the needle on academic outcomes perhaps can be held to that standard. But for educators, I think there's a case to be made of the benefits of out-of-school time in terms of what they contribute to their bottom line in terms of kids' school success and academic achievement. It's also clear, and the recent meta-analysis um, suggests this, that you can get a whole array of socio-emotional outcomes, important outcomes in terms of kids' um, motivation, in terms of their problem behaviors, in terms of their self-esteem, a whole related sort of set of socio-emotional outcomes that we know are important to kids' learning. It's not that they're siloed and it's nice to have them. There's increasing evidence that they then relate to your capacity to learn and the very kinds of outcomes that we're talking about that schools value. We're also clearly getting prevention outcomes. The, the evidence is perhaps a little thinner there, but there's evidence that you can provide a whole, you can prevent a whole set of problem behaviors that communities worry about, teen pregnancy, crime, um, delinquency, all those kinds of things. Um, and with the new emphasis on health and wellness and obesity prevention, there are a number of studies now that suggest you can get a variety of kinds of health benefits in terms of food choices, increased physical activity, and there are even a few that suggest they can um, move the needle on, on things like um, body mass index. So we're seeing an array of kinds of outcomes um, from these kinds of interventions that speak to a variety of constituents um, who we want to invest in these programs. Schools, communities, families, um, people that are concerned about health and wellness. What we don't have, I don't think, is a theory of change, if you will, 
that interconnects these kinds of outcomes and how they all work together to support kids' learning. Um, people like Deborah Vandell have made a convincing case that we need to have not just the academic part of programs, but all of the other kinds of enrichment activities that move the needle on the socio-emotional stuff. Um, and it's that combination, and she's tried to test that in some of her search. But I think we have to, in the future, be doing better at explicating our theory and how these different aspects of what we do contribute to learning. And I choose my words carefully, not just to academic achievement, but, but to kids' learning and development. Um, this array of interrelated outcomes is important, and it's important particularly in our discussion about how we're going to extend the, learn day, extend the learning day um, with respect to schools. The argument that I make, and I've got some evidence from particular studies behind it, is that there are a number of evaluations that underscore the importance of a variety of kinds of activities and options for kids in after school to move the needle on academic achievement. So I look at things like the task evaluation in New York, multi-site school-based after school programs, and Liz Reasoner's work that suggests that programs that not just provide the academic piece but provide enrichment and sports and recreation are the ones that were most likely to move the needle on academic achievement. So in this broader conversation we're having with schools, the message is skill and drill, total focus on academic achievement, in the end may not move the needle on academic achievement. Our sense is also that those kinds of programs are less likely to have kids participate. And if they don't participate, they don't benefit. So in this broader conversation we are having and will continue to have with schools, there is now increasingly an evidence-based case for an array of things, many of the kinds of things your programs provide, as important to a, an array of outcomes, the academic ones, but also other kinds of developmental outcomes for kids. Other people may read the evidence differently. The case is not as, as strong, but it's an area where I think we will be doing more investigation and, and getting, um, you know, we'll be testing this proposition that I'm laying out. Um, I think it's also clear that all these benefits are contingent on the provision of high quality programs and activities. Those activities obviously change for kids between uh, kindergarten and 12th grade. If you look at the evidence, we have a lot more evidence of impact in the elementary and middle school years. There's not a huge research base to draw from, although there's some new studies that are beginning now to look at the benefits for kids as they get well into adolescence and high school. A lot of those are keyed around the new interest in creating a pathway from high school to college for kids. So there are good studies in the pipeline that are going to give us some understanding of what it, whether we can move the needle with respect to uh, high school completion and college entrance or some kind of postgraduate um, employment or training. Um, and you know, with the contribution of out-of-school time programs with respect to that. Um, so it's clear that you know, we've got to be developmental in our lens and recognize it's going to be you know, different kinds of programs over the life cycle. We've got good evidence on the front end, and we're getting um, you know, better evidence as, as we get into studies that look at the benefits for older kids. I think what this tells us is we can make a case to policymakers that we are a good investment, but as a field, there's also some caution flags. There are a bunch of evaluations that show no benefits, and there are some evaluations that suggest we could actually do harm. Um, Joe Mahoney's work in New Haven on program and in Sweden, um, where he's done some work, suggests that you can actually have programs that bring t kids together, th poorly structured programs where there's not a lot of attention to physical and psychological safety that may actually do harm to kids. Um, and we all know there are not good programs out there, so there's the risk of that. Um, so I think we need to really focus because of that on questions of quality um, and, and proceed with caution. Um, I also think it's, it's clear that, as I said, after-school programs are not a magic bullet. And as I talk to people around the country, there's more and more recognition of that and a willingness to partner with other key players in the after-school arena, partner with schools, et cetera. That's another caution. Proceeding as the Lone Ranger, selling ourselves as the magic bullet, um, I think sets us up for failure. So that's another kind of caution. Um, as we've looked at what are the factors from the research that we look at, the, particularly the evaluations we look at in our database, we pull out um, 
participation, quality, and partnership. And I want to share a little of what I think we found. But let me say we have a much less strong evidence base for what I'm about to say now. A lot of the work on quality or that has implications for quality is correlational or descriptive. We have more work to do on quality. So my three things um, are tentative. Um, as we get more evaluation, um, as we as an evolving community think more about quality, um, what I'm saying may in fact need to be modified, changed. Um, so it's a tentative sort of set of um, generalizations from what my colleagues and I look at. The research, research brief I'm talking about, we're circulating now to other researchers, evaluators, practitioners, and policy people for feedback. Um, because we want to make sure that there is some widespread or at least some consensus around what we've pulled out of this stuff. So take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. Um, with respect to participation, if you're not there, you're not going to benefit, pretty obvious. Um, but I also think from our work with some several large data sets on who participates in out-of-school time programs, there is a clear pattern of winners and losers. And the losers are economically disadvantaged children and youth. Um, we've got some research um, now out in peer-reviewed journals as well as other places that suggest children and, fam children and youth whose families have higher incomes and more education are more likely to participate in after-school activities. They're going to do so with greater frequency during the week. They're going to participate in a greater number of different activities within a week or a month. And they're more likely to participate in enrichment programs, while their disadvantaged peers are more likely to participate in tutoring programs. And they're not reaping the benefits of these enrichment activities. Um, so we've got um, some real issues around access to programs for poor kids. We've also done research that suggests one of the drivers of participation for kids um, is parenting and parenting practices. So that parents that kind of know they've got to help their kids access learning activities that are more nurturant parents um, in the bomb rind sense of sort of um, authoritative parents are more likely to have kids that are participating in out of school time programs. For me, that has two implications. One is can we work with less advantaged parents to help them understand the benefits of out-of-school time programs and help their kids access them. And when that doesn't happen, can we make sure that those kids get into after-school programs in some other way? Because it enables them to build a quality relationship with a caring adult, which we know is predictive of better outcomes for those kids. So the family piece of this is critically important. The 21st Century Learning Evaluation and a recent one that came out of the Bell um, After School and Summer Program both suggest that high quality out of school time programs um, can move the needle on family involvement in the kids' school. That's just two studies, but I think we have the potential to leverage the environment of after school, which can be supportive of families in a variety of ways, um, to advantage in terms of getting those kids more in, or those parents more involved in their kids' schools. So the family piece of this around participation is critical to be thinking about. Um, it's also um, clear, and I like to frame this in um, sort of social justice terms, that our lack of access for, for poor kids is a social justice um, issue. And we're going to deal with it not just a question, as a question of participation, but a question of access. Um, if after school is a big benefit and is moving the needle for kids who participate in a, with respect to a variety of academic and developmental outcomes and poor kids aren't getting near as much of it, if we don't address that, we risk increasing the achievement gap rather than reducing it. Um, places like New York um, have addressed this by looking at the allocation of public resources for after school and biting the political bullet to reallocate the resources so that there are more um, out-of-school time program and youth services around failing schools. So they mapped where the money was going. They then said we need to redistribute that money so that it, more poor kids in failing schools are getting access to it. And took the city council and the mayor took all the substantial political heat that was involved in making that decision. And that uh, sort of decision and the reallocation of those resources is now being um, examined 
to see if, in fact, those programs are improving outcomes for kids in those neighborhoods with those failing schools. So we'll know if that resulted both in participation of those kids and did it move the needle on their achievement. So that's a study in the works. Keep your eye out for it. Um, in terms of the quality programs, and that's what you guys are really focusing on, I think we have learned some things um, about quality. Um, I think we've learned that it's a function of appropriate structure and supervision, well-prepared staff, intentional programming, and the intentional programming and our ideas about that are very much influenced by the work of Joe Durlach and Roger um, Weisberg. Um, appropriate structure and supervision um, is, I think, critical in this. Um, it isn't just the youth worker, it's the youth worker in a context. Um, and it's that appropriate supervision and structure, I think, as part of that context that allows a well-trained youth worker to practice well. We did a study um, a year or two ago looking at any evidence there was in four fields of the connection between the human service workforce and things to try to strengthen the human service workforce and outcomes for kids and families. We looked at child welfare, youth development, early childhood, and out of school time. And it was remarkable how little evidence there was that connected investments of a variety of sorts in the human service workforce, pre and in service, literally to better outcomes for kids. Child welfare, particularly early childhood, and then child welfare are further along in looking at that relationship. And the early findings from those two sectors suggest that it isn't just individual worker characteristics and training, it's the capacity and supports for that worker to practice well in the organizational context and the supports for that practice. That means that one-shot workshops where you bring in somebody and you know, try to inform them and change their practice, which is the norm in many arenas, are not going to work probably, because that one worker will then come back to an organizational setting without the supervision and other organizational supports that allow them to bring that new practice into the organization. So one of the results of our work is really looking organizationally and not just individually at how we enhance the human service workforce. Um, and I think that has huge implications for our training um, in the out-of-school time arena. Um, everybody knows we have to bite the bullet in terms of compensation um, for youth workers. I don't have a lot of insight to offer in that, but there are studies that show um, across these human service sectors that increases in compensation lead to longer staying staff, um, lead to more willingness to invest and in part of the individual worker in professional development because they plan to stay in the arena for a while and I think probably lead to better practice and better outcomes. So we're beginning to knit together that story that connects compensation and as, as one of the kind of supports for youth work to better outcomes. But I think we have a ways to go with respect to that. Um, it's also clear that intentional programming really matters. And I point you to the work of Joe Durlach and Roger Weisbord with respect to that because um, I think they have a, good, a really good discussion of what that means. So I think what this is suggesting is that we know at least something about quality. We have a lot more to learn, um, but there's some things we can then put back into practice. When I look at the Out of School Time Arena and talk to funders um, at places like Grant Makers in Education and other settings that I'm in, I always make the point this is, this is an arena that has evidence has invested in the research and the evaluation, and has made a commitment to use that for continuous improvement. This has huge implications for the evaluation we work we do at the program and the system level. All of you are somehow involved in out-of-school time activities, I'm assuming, here in Minneapolis or in Minnesota. One of the things that I, as an evaluator, and I think your evaluators need to do for you as providers, is to build your capacity to get and use data, both to demonstrate the value added of your service to your funders and your community, but also to, to build your capacity for continuous improvement. As we learn more and more about quality, it's going to change our practice. Um, your own data, presumably, and analysis of your own data will, will change and improve your practice. 
So when I say to people, how do you position as a set of services trying to make a claim on public resources and increase your claim on public resources, one of the ways to do that is not just demonstrate that you have an outcome you know, from one study at one point in time, but to have the capacity to demonstrate over time that you're adding value and that you're using your data to understand um, how you're doing and improve how you're doing. So on the participation issue, um, we are now writing a proposal for a national foundation to study participation and have been looking around to figure out who collects and uh, collects, never mind uses, systematic data on participation. And it's remarkable how little there is. Um, so a tiny program with a $50,000 budget could track the participation of, of your, um, the folks you're trying to reach and start asking questions like, we're trying to make sure we get poor kids in this neighborhood as well as non-poor kids. Do we have enough poor kids coming in here? And if not, why not? And what do we need to do to change that? So there's simple questions that you can, that you can do. Some of you, I mentioned in my talk on evaluation yesterday, um, Project Match, which is a welfare to work program in Cabrini Green in Chicago. They track the participation of women in this program. Their original program philosophy was get the women educated, the GED or whatever, and then help them find work. Tracking participation, they saw that when they did education first, the women dropped out. They might come back a year or a year and a half later and say, gosh, now that we've been out slinging hamburgers at McDonald's with minimum wage, we know we need an education. Help us get the GED or whatever. Simply tracking those patterns of participation got them to completely change their intervention model to work first. And when they did that and tested it, they saw that women who did work first were more likely than to come back, get their education, complete their GED, and get a livable wage. So just tracking participation in a simple way um, as part of this uh, data and quality improvement stuff, I think can yield all kinds of things that will help you as a program, but also help us as a field. So really thinking about the role of evaluation and how you're going to position it is, is critically important. Um, I want to end by talking about what I think are the big picture challenges that I hope we can talk and you guys will think about. Um, I've sketched this frame um, in which we're going to be extending the school day. I think that's happening in New Mexico. It's happening in Massachusetts. You're going to see it happening around the country. I think because of that, there's a set of questions that you should be focusing on. What's going to be the relationship between out-of-school time and schools? What's it going to be? What are different models of that relationship? What are different possibilities? I think this is going to happen. I think it's going to be important for youth development, out-of-school time providers to be ready for that conversation with an array of possibilities that you think will work in terms of meeting your mutual desire to support kids' learning and development. Second is... What are going to be the outcomes from these combined models? What are our expectations for outcomes going to be? Is it going to be academic achievement? Deborah Vandell um, and Liz Reasoner released a study last Thursday in Washington from their Promising Practices work that showed remarkable gains in academic achievement on standardized tests as a result of youth development and out-of-school time programs. That is going to create a very interesting conversation because they got amazing academic outcomes. Does that mean everybody else has to? Is it going to be enough to have homework completion or attendance? Where are we going to set the bar? And it may be we set the bar in multiple places depending upon the intervention. But I think there's an important conversation to be had about what are we going to be looking for and what are we going to be measuring with respect to learning and school success. Um, I also think it's going to be important to think, and this is where the Gabrielli Mass 2020 model is so important, um, we've got to think about how we're going to take what we've learned about how kids learn in after-school programs with experiential learning, project-based learning, um, a variety of kind of community service activities um, that we've demonstrated support learning. How are we going to take that kind of, of learning from our own practice and infuse it into the school day and vice versa. If you the Mass 2020 model, the notion is that after school providers, say, take citizen schools, 
that are partnering with the schools in that model are supposed to infuse what they're doing in citizen schools in terms of supporting kids' learning and development into the whole school day. Casey and, and Atlantic Philanthropies are supporting an equivalent kind of experiment at one school in East Baltimore. So thinking about what you have to contribute that's going to really enrich the school day, not just add on to it, but enrich it, and infuse what are some very important instructional practices developed in out-of-school time into the school day is an important thing to be thinking about. I've already challenged you on the, on the access issue, and I think it's not just access. As we read the data, particularly as kids get older, and this also follows from Liz and Liz Reasoner and Deborah Vandell's work, as kids get older, meaning into middle school, and then certainly as they graduate from middle school, they no longer participate in programs. My daughter at age 10 said, I'm not going to after school anymore. It's not going to happen, Mom. And, you know, I tore my hair out to figure out how we're going to get her to the set of things she wanted to do. I think we've all had that experience. So the notion that we're going to have programs and not sets of activities with choices for kids is an important one to infuse into the, into the conversation. So it's not just access to a program, it's choice, and it's particularly important if we're going to keep kids engaged as they grow older. That's where I point to places like the After Zone, which is a middle school model in Providence, where they've created an after-school campus with lots of choices and transportation for the kids to and from those choices. So it's not just access. I think it's, we've also got to think about choice and an array of choices and possibilities for kids. A very hard thing to achieve, I'd be the first to tell you. But I think the evidence I read suggests its importance. I've also said I think there's a huge advocacy challenge. As my colleagues and I work with some of the foundations that support us, to think about the messages and the advocacy for out-of-school time and youth development. What we see is a lot of particular models advocating for themselves, whether it's summer learning or after school or a particular model like citizen schools or the Bell Learning Academies or whatever. So trying to get one voice in youth development and out-of-school time as an advocacy voice is a challenge. I think the second and equally important challenge is for us to advocate for ourselves as necessary but not sufficient, recognizing it's an array of supports, the Jeffrey Canada kind of thing, you know, at a much lower cost, um, that's going to be what it takes to get, uh, to get kids through the pipeline, particularly poor kids through the pipeline. We do single issue advocacy in this country. We're successful at it. We get things that way. Trying to change and make the advocacy conversation more complex is going to be wickedly hard to do, but I would argue is going to be important. Atlantic Philanthropies is beginning to invest in that. Um, we'll see what happens with it, and, and I, you know, I urge you to track it and see what happens. Um, so I think we have a lot of challenges in the out-of-school time arena. Um, for me, the biggest one uh, I think is pretty obvious, and that's how we're going to relate to schools. I think there is a readiness, and we debated at lunch with many of you who are at lunch. My view is that there's going to be an increasing readiness on the part of schools to partner with us. And the challenge is to set the terms in ways that everybody's going to benefit, including kids. Um, and that, to me, means we're not just going to be looking at narrow academic outcomes that meet the needs of schools as partners, but also helping to educate schools about what learning and development means and the range of outcomes we want. So I urge you to start thinking and worrying about that because I think um, the challenge is on us and we need to be ready to respond. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Uh, let's take a few, uh, if we can get the panelists to come up, we'll take a few questions while they're coming up as well. But let's uh, have some questions for Heather and I'll try to get the microphone to you. So Heidi? Thanks. You talked about intentional programming as one of the um, areas that we really need to look at. Can you kind of define that and give some examples as, as to what you mean there? I didn't hear the first part of the question. I'm sorry. Oh, you talked about, talk about intentional programming as part of the quality programs yeah. portion. Can, can you tell us what you mean by intentional? I, I think it's that, for example, it, at one level, it's that if I'm going to try to move the needle on, on school success... Um, I'm going to have homework help. I'm going to have tried to connect 
the school day and, and that homework help in some way so that somebody in the after school program has had a conversation with the teacher and begun to build that bridge to the teacher about the homework and what they're trying to accomplish with the homework and that kind of stuff. So that's one level of intentional. Well, not even a logic model, just connections with the school day so that information is going across about the homework and we know that the after school providers have some capacity to support that homework. Um, so that's one example of intentional. I think the other is, uh, or there, there are other meanings of it, and it's that you have a well-structured program with activities um, that are clearly defined and you know, adults that are, that are providing the structure around those kinds of activities. Um, and there's a, there's a flow across the activities um, with the supervision and supports necessary um, within them. Um, so it's not kind of a free-for-all. I mean, that's one thing. And then you've got the supports for these different kinds of things that are going on across the program. Um, do other people have notions about this? One thing I would add is that uh, myself and Joyce Walker and Lynn Borden and others have written a piece on the uh, theory of intentionality of what youth work looks like. And Joyce has written another article recently that we have copies of uh, about what that intentionality theory means for practice in various ways. So. Uh, both intentional practitioners and intentional programs where the pieces fit together and describing what those pieces are. So that might be something else that would be yeah. worth looking at. In, in, uh, Joe Durlach, I, they have one view of this. It tends to be a good one. They, they're the ones that did the meta-analysis of uh, 73 after-school programs. And they talk about um, sequenced activities using a sequenced set of activities designed to achieve skill development objectives. Um, active, you're using active forms of learning to help develop those skills. Focused, the program components are devoted to you know, developing those skills, so it's focused on, then there's that sort of intentionality. And explicit, um, targeting of particular skills. Um, so it's, it's the sequence, it's that set of things that sort of, to me, mean intentional. Um, and their meta-analysis suggests that programs that have that are the ones that are more likely to, to show outcomes. Um, Another question here, if you'd introduce yourself. Noemi Trevino from the Department of Education. Curious, is there a direct correlation between program, after school programs that are directed to students of color and or socioeconomic, lower, lower socioeconomic status students? Is there a direct correlation that when it's focused on those issues, you know, by exposing or having access to these programs, those kids do indeed participate yeah. the, at a higher rate. In our database, in our database, um, you know, I don't think it should be any surprise to you guys that that a lot of the evaluations are funded by. Some of them are funded by the government. Um, a lot of them are funded by philanthropy. Philanthropy is interested in moving the needle for poor kids. So a lot of the evaluations are programs that are directed at poor kids. Not all of them, but many of them. And a number of those evaluations show that when you um, provide high quality, get participation at, of sufficient um, duration um, and intensity, um, you can move the needle on these kinds of outcomes for poor kids. So, you, I mean, so if your question is, is there data that shows if you provide, if you get high participation in high quality programs, you can move the needle on a variety of outcomes for poor kids? The answer is yes. Is that your question? No. Is there a higher participation? Is there higher participation of students of color when it's focused on them, on them specifically? On the, on I don't. The, you know, I don't know if I honestly don't know of, of data on that question. Um, it may be there, and I honestly don't know about it. Um, and they're particularly not so much with the issues of culture and color, but with the issues of economics uh, and or at-risk kids. When you pool at-risk kids there are some disadvantages. So it's the balance of young people in a program that becomes important. Yeah. One more question before we go to our panel. All right, I'm here with the Big Brother, Big Sister program, and I guess what I'm asking is, is the data you're looking at with, with after school, out of school time, to what degree are you looking at um, individual mentorships? Um, and that's what I'm working with. Um, we have some programs that are, you know, mentoring studies in our database. Um, Public Private Ventures has done, I think, one of the most recent ones that shows the huge value of mentoring programs. Um, so there is data that, that 
supports investments in big brothers and big sisters um, that's high quality data. Do you know the PPV study? So yes, I mean there is there's good data in support of mentoring. What we see is um, let me give you an example. We were just in New, I was just in New Mexico um, looking at some programs on an Indian reservation that Atlantic Philanthropies is supporting as part of their integrated services effort. And their model includes after school programs, better schools, after school programs, parent involvement, but also big brothers, big sisters. So there's a mentoring component as well as an out of school time component in that very intensive model. So what we're beginning to see are big brothers and big sisters pairing up uh, with other models um, to provide sort of more intense support for youth development. And that, that'll be one to watch, I think.